And so I think what happens in Egypt going forward is an open question. And while I would love to be helping there, I have moved on to other things. There is a huge amount of work to be done, not only during these events, but in the follow-up. And part of the reason I'm, I'm eager to give this talk is because I'm hoping to find people who want to help and also try to give you some idea of if you want to do that, whether with telecomics or on your own, um, lay out some principles for, for doing this kind of work. So if you guys want to join me in this eager pad here, if anybody's online, um, we see this. It's not too small. Um, have have that telecomics.org uh, slash free dash people. This is just some notes uh, and the start of an outline for design principles for hacktivist software. So I'm going to just sort of talk talk through these. If people want to edit it, that's cool. Um, all right, for people watching, this is Etherpad is a collaborative editor. Wow, there's a whole lot of you. Hi, guys. Um, you can set your names. And just I'll edit this document collaboratively. When I do this kind of work, my objective is to help people get what achieve, help people achieve what they want for themselves. This is not about what I want for them, it's not about what, what we want for them. And so if people are let's say in Syria right now want a democratic government, that's great. If they want a government that is based a little more on Islamic law, that's their business. I might not help them do it, but that's their business. And sitting here in the States, I don't have any right to tell them what sort of society they want for themselves. Like, if I think they're moving in the direction that I approve of, I might help. But I'm not going to gonna sit here and lecture to them. That sort of attitude applies to the technical side as well. There is often a tendency, particularly in the wake of Egypt, for people to run around with their favorite hammer. To say, I've got this cool technology that I'm interested in, and here's an opportunity for me to hammer on some nails. Um, mesh networking, I think people are crazy for mesh networking right now. It's really cool technology, but what should be driving your motivations when you do this, driving your selections of particular technology, is what people on the ground need. Right. If you want to play around with mesh networks, that's great, and I, and I do am glad that people are trying to work on this stuff, but you know, maybe you're better off doing that, that on your own time. If it's helpful, you're great, but that's, that's the priority. Um, some ground rules that kind of, I think, are useful, but I try to follow. Um, don't do anything violent, ask questions. Um, have fun. Like this is hard work. It's hard work. It's serious business, and you need to take breaks. You need to laugh at yourself and at the situation a little bit, or you'll go nuts. Um, I've been doing this full time for the last nine months, and if you can't can't find those opportunities, you're just gonna either give up or get messed up. Um, the best way not to get arrested, and like like I said, talk comics doesn't need to do anything illegal. But the best way not to get arrested is not to do anything illegal to begin with. That said, jurisdiction counts. Um, I don't know if the work we did in Egypt was legal from the perspective of the Egyptian government. I don't know if what we're doing in Syria is legal in Syria. And I don't really care. I don't really care. Um, I want to talk about different scales sort of in the tools that we can build here, different scales of solutions for communications. And I'm just going to use Egypt as an example. And so the four different scales I think we saw here were Tahrir Square itself. So the people needed ways of communicating just within the square, just to sort of talk to each other so that when some thugs with sticks and rocks and stuff came in from the west end of the square, that those people had a way of letting folks on the east end know what was going on. Right? It's huge. I mean, Three square is like two miles, two miles 
cost. We also saw a need for something like at the level of Cairo. So communication between different neighborhoods. One of the things the Egyptian government did was they released a whole bunch of prisoners from jails and then got on the state television and encouraged people to set up roadblocks. Said, hey, there's all these criminals, they broke out of jail, they're running them up. Protect yourself, protect your neighborhood. And as a consequence of that, people in the different neighborhoods were not able to communicate with each other because you couldn't get into neighborhood A if you were from neighborhood B and didn't know these people. And so, it's brilliant, right? It's a brilliant tactic if you're trying to disrupt a mass movement. So, right, communication at the neighborhood level, uh, or the neighborhood or city level. We also saw a need for country level, so sort of all of Egypt. So, there's a movement in Cairo, it's trying to coordinate with Suez, it's trying to coordinate with Alexandria, which was completely cut off for 24 or 36 hours, right? Much larger scale. There's also a global scale here, too. And that is the need to get information into the country and back out. Right? So that's certainly where Twitter and kind of trying to get news out to journalists and the videos, that sort of stuff. And then also from you know getting messages of support and you know medical treatments and stuff like that back then. These are radically different scales. These are radically different scales. And I don't think we can pick one size solutions that fit all of them. Um, you know, you don't need global access to the global internet to organize your city. Right? Twitter's a nice and centralized service, Facebook is a great centralized service, but if you had similar services on a local net, you could do that just fine, right? There's nothing inherent about some of these smaller scales needing to rely on the internet in the way that you know communication from Egypt to the US or Egypt to the outside. Some observations. Getting software installed is really hard, particularly for large numbers of people. I mean, we know how small low the rates of browser plugin uptake are. To say nothing of, of Tor. Um, you know, Tor usage in Egypt skyrocketed during this to 2000 people out of a country of 83 million. It's certainly helping, and I certainly think you know Jake Falcon and those dudes got it into some good hands, but that's not a sizable solution. Getting hardware on the ground is even harder. Um, UPS kept shipping until January 28th to Cairo, but you need to know somebody specifically there, you need to have this all ready to go ahead of time. It's just, for, except for sort of particular organizations that maybe can get satellite phones in, like that's not something that is just a group of volunteers As a result of that, I believe that the way to do this is you want to try to use the software and hardware that's already on the ground. Right? It's hard to get stuff in, so you've got to use what's there. Um, the problem with that is a lot of the technology in these places is three to 10 years out of date. It's three to 10 years out of date. That's phones, that's desktops, that's laptops, it's all pretty old. Um, in Egypt, the connectivity split was about 20% by Wi-Fi, 20% by Ethernet, and 60% by dial-up modem. That was before the revolution. That was just the norm. And there's certainly people who have access to internet cafes, which provides its own set of privacy and anonymity challenges where you don't have the hardware. But that's like radically different than what we're used to when we're building like snazzy web apps. Um, I also like to say that things pass the grandmother test. Uh, somebody has changed this here to novice test. Awesome. Um, the folks in these countries, just like most of the folks in the US and in Europe, are not super technically savvy. They're eager, but they just don't have the background. You know, they don't really understand how SSL works. They don't really understand how the a man in the middle attack on an SSL cert would work. Right? It's, kind of, it's technically sophisticated, it's complicated. And so the tools that we provide them need to be as user-friendly and simple as possible. I like to say that you know, you're targeting this software 
or hardware, whatever it is you're building for your grandma to use. Because also, they're in the middle of a revolution or, you know, protesting your government. And they don't have time. They don't have time to read docs and they don't have time to poke around. You know, they need something that basically works out of the box. In line with those principles, I like to ask what we can throw at. Right? If you have no communication at all, then a little something is better. Right? Can you what features can you get rid of? Like really basic things that we take for granted. Um, you know, sometimes that means security, sometimes that means authentication, sometimes that means um, dynamic updatable content. But really, if your priority is getting those lines back open, get rid of as much as you possibly can. Um, other stuff that's important, uh, safety. Right? These people are living and protesting in some really dangerous places. In Tunisia, the government injected JavaScript uh, using a proxy to sniff people's Facebook passwords. In Syria, they just torture people. They literally will torture people for their Facebook passwords and accounts when they're arrested. That's crazy to me. It's crazy to me both that the internet is playing that sort of role and that people do that to each other over a Facebook page. But it's important to keep in mind that you know we are mucking around with people's lives when we do this. And that's a heavy responsibility to take on. Um, connectivity is expensive, intermittent, slow, monitored. Uh, the users are surprisingly resourceful. They're surprisingly resourceful at figuring out stuff when you give them a start. Also, you have zero dollar budget. You have no budget. Everything we do is a volunteer, as an office of comics, is a volunteer organization. We don't take donations. All right, it's challenging. Um, The two models I like to use here in terms of what kind of communication solutions we're talking about are a community message board. So this is something like, think the bulletin board at your neighborhood coffee shop, where people can put up ads, or they can put up flyers for their band's concert. Right? It's a public posting board. Um, other things in this model, uh, Usenet. Right? Everybody remembers Usenet. Um, also, 4chan. 4chan is the largest message board on, on the net. Crazy. Uh, but that model of anonymous communication to, to a public board. The next form that seems to work, work well is real-time chat. That can be by voice. That can be by instant messenger. It can be by text. Uh, one of the things we talked about doing was writing up a how-to for building two-way radios for repurposed consumer electronics. If you take a pair of alarm clock radios and you like smash them up and cross three wires, you get a walkie-talkie. You take build two of those, you now have a system with about a two-kilometer range. That lets point-to-point -point or small group conversation. Right? So not only digital technology is useful here, but analog stuff as well. Um, there's some more, some more notes here. Um, if people want to look through it, and awesome people adding stuff, like that makes me really, really happy. 